Okay, so it's a great pleasure to have Professor Sean Michael Carroll uh, from uh, Walter Brook Institute for Theoretical Physics in the Caltech. And he's a research professor there. Uh, as a physicist, I don't need to give a big introduction to him because all of us have uh, already read. Because like, uh, it, as a student, I read your book, the GR book, which is the famous one. And we know what uh, Sean uh, did in his earlier uh, research career. He is an expert actually on the quantum aspects of cosmology, um, uh, various quantum aspects of gravity and all. Today he will talk about uh, particularly uh, so today he will talk about extracting the universe from the wave function, which is one of the uh, important issue uh, in this particular area, this quantum aspects of cosmology. And uh, I have to say thank you to Sean for agreeing to give this talk. So this is the uh, uh, if I am not wrong, this is the 34th seminar uh, series and you are the speaker and uh, we are welcoming you uh, from Potsdam. And uh, yeah, you can start. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's It's been interesting to try to sort of gear back up in terms of uh, hitting the travel circuit without actually leaving my office lately. So uh, I'm giving three different talks this week. I feel like I'm, you know, things are back, <laughs> back in swing again. Uh, this is going to be, you know, the, the sort of physics technical talk uh, that I give. I do realize that, well, let me, let me put it this way. I'm not exactly sure the different levels of expertise of people in the audience. So the talk that I prepared um, starts at a level where everyone will understand and it ends at a level where nobody will understand. So everyone in the audience should have the experience of getting lost at some point uh, or, or another, or I haven't really done my job. And the topic is, uh, you know, it's an interesting one because it's one of those ones where we could have talked about this decades ago, uh, you know, quantum mechanics and, and cosmology, but it's not so much cosmology in the usual sense of galaxies and inflation in the CMB as just the universe we live in, okay? Like the world of tables and chairs and three-dimensional space. Uh, I wanna ask how you figure out that such a world exists just starting from the bare bones of quantum mechanics. And usually this is a question that is not asked because we just put it there by hand. We assume the answer from the start. And as I'm gonna argue, we should take a step back and, and think about things from deeper principles. So let's start very, very simple with classical mechanics, just so I can highlight some of the differences here, right? We all know about classical mechanics. There's Isaac Newton. And when you teach classical mechanics, there's a lot that goes on, but it comes down to two things that you need to know if you're studying a classical system. There is a state of the system. So the system might be one particle or many particles. It might be a field. It might be the metric on space-time. And that has a state, so it has a point in phase space, right? Uh, a generalized position and momentum. And then you have some equations of motion, either from Newton or from Hamilton's equations or the Euler-Lagrange equations or what have you. So you start with a system in some state and you evolve it using equations of motion. And that's the entire theory. That's all you really need to know. And then it was Pierre Simon Laplace who pointed out the implication of this, that there was this deterministic feature of Newtonian mechanics, that if you know the position and velocity of everything in the universe at any one time, then Newtonian mechanics predicts the entire future and the entire past uh, exactly. And then of course, quantum mechanics comes along and messes things up a little bit. So, but it starts, this is, this is what I wanna emphasize, the starting point of quantum mechanics is exactly parallel to classical mechanics because in classical mechanics, you had a state and equations of motion. In quantum mechanics, you have a state and equation of motion, but the state now is a wave function or a vector in Hilbert space. And the equation of motion is the Schrodinger equation. Here's Professor Schrodinger here. Uh, so, so far, so good, right? Like that were all the mechanics. 
uh, it would be just as easy as classical mechanics. There'd be some complex numbers and some linear algebra, but in fact, the equation of motion is linear, the Schrodinger equation, so it'd be easier than classical mechanics in some sense. The problem, the reason why quantum mechanics is hard, one of the major reasons, is because the rules of quantum mechanics don't stop there. In classical mechanics, those were the rules, and that's all you needed to know. But in quantum mechanics, there are extra rules dealing with what happens when you measure something, right? We've all struggled through learning these rules in uh, undergraduate school or whatever. Uh, what you learn is that only certain quantities can possibly be observed, right? Uh, there are Hermitian or self-adjoint operators that give you uh, observational results. And when you observe something, you cannot observe the state of the system, right? The state is the wave function. That's not something that is observable. You measure things about it, and those measurements can only be predicted probabilistically. You have the Born rule that says the probability of getting any certain measurement outcome is given by the amplitude of the wave function corresponding to that outcome squared, okay? So that's the best you can do. And you know, we could live with that, but, but it's definitely a departure from classical theory. And then the especially weird thing is that after you measure it, the quantum state, or at, at the moment you measure it, perhaps, the quantum state changes suddenly and dramatically, okay? We say the wave function collapses. Uh, if you have a spin that is in a superposition of spin up and spin down, then as soon as you measure it, you always get either spin up or spin down, and afterward, the, that system is now exactly spin up or exactly spin down, one of those two things. So there's these whole bunch of extra rules you need to learn about quantum mechanics. And I'm gonna be very blunt about this. This is terrible. <laughs> this should make us very uncomfortable. Most of us are uncomfortable when we're uh, undergraduates learning this for the first time, and then we learn to cope with it somehow or another. But <clears throat> look, it's not terrible because we're, we're, you know, complaining that God doesn't play dice or something like that. If the fundamental laws of physics were not deterministic, we would learn to live with that. That's fine. We accept what nature tells us. That's our job as scientists. The reason why this story is terrible is because it's vague and incomplete and a, not a well-defined physical theory. We've said that observations play a crucial role in the dynamics, but we haven't said what an observation is, what counts as an observation. When does it occur? Does it need to be a human being? Could it be you know, a, a rat or a video camera? We haven't said that in part of defining the theory. In the usual way of talking about quantum mechanics, there's a quantum mechanical system that you're measuring, but you treat yourself as classical. You don't talk about your own wave function, oops. Where'd that come from? There's a line on my screen now. I don't know where that came from. Um, so we don't know how to divide the classical world from the quantum world. We don't know why there's probabilities involved, okay? So all of these questions come up and none of them in the traditional way of textbook quantum mechanics are answered. And so this is why we have a whole field called interpreting quantum mechanics. You know, there was no field called interpreting electromagnetism or interpreting special relativity or interpreting uh, classical mechanics. We didn't need that. It was just obvious. Whereas quantum mechanics seems to require some interpretation. So the way I think about this is um, here is Richard Feynman, my, my uh, predecessor at Caltech. And he's, he famously said, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. And you know, that's, you can argue whether it's true or not. I think that some people think they understand quantum mechanics and some might even be correct, but nobody thinks that everyone else understands quantum mechanics. There's not a consensus about it. And by itself, that would be fine, right? Like there's no problem admitting that there are things we don't understand in physics. The problem is that we're not trying to understand it, right? Like it's, there's plenty of things we don't understand and therefore we put effort into trying to do better, right? We don't understand quantum gravity or what the dark matter is. So we put effort into trying to do that. With the foundations of quantum mechanics, the, the field as a whole has largely said, nope, that's not physics. We're not interested in doing that anymore. So the analogy I like to use, I like to bring up uh, Aesop's fable of the fox and the grapes. Uh, and so here is the, the, I don't know if you're familiar with this story, there's a fox, the fox sees some grapes up there in the tree, and the fox would like the grapes. They seem very juicy and sweet, so the fox keeps jumping for them, but he can't reach them, okay? So ultimately, the fox ends up saying, you know what? I never wanted those grapes anyway. They were probably sour. So obviously, he's just telling the fox to make 
So, so you in the fox represents physicists and the grapes represent understanding quantum mechanics. We've given up on trying to understand quantum mechanics and we now tell ourselves we never wanted to do that in the first place. So I think that's, I think that's bad. I think that's a mistake. Also what's bad, I don't know if you can see this yellow line on my screen, um, but I can see it and it's bugging me. So I'm gonna to try to see if I can't get rid of that somehow. I'm just gonna pause here for a second. Uh, yep, that's definitely there, look at that. Um, I'm gonna to switch to a different window. Maybe that will be helpful. Sorry about this. No, it's okay, no problem. You Do you see that yellow line that I see? No, 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 no. Now you right here it disappeared. Oh, Sorry, you... here. What is that? I don't uh, know. Uh, uh, so when you're sharing the screen, uh, there is an option to annotate. So some participant has annotated the screen. Uh, but, oh. since you're, yeah, <laughs> but since you're sharing the screen, you can disable that actually. Uh, it should be somewhere at the top. All right. Uh, annotate. Oh, in the view options, you can see that. I got it. You're right. Look at this. Sorry, it's going to take. <laughs> I can erase it. Thank you. Someone is a Zoom expert. I like that. Okay, very good. All right. Back to uh, back to where we were. Yeah. Look okay. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> But now I can't uh, move. Okay. Come on. There we go. Here we go. All right. So where we were was me complaining about uh, the field of physics in what I would call abandoning their job of trying to understand quantum mechanics and saying that's just philosophy. That's not really physics. I think it is really physics. And I'll try to make the case that it actually matters a lot to how we do physics. And to give away um, the story, I'm gonna be in favor of uh, this version of quantum mechanics offered by Hugh Everett in 1957, what is called the many worlds interpretation. And the many worlds interpretation has a sort of bad reputation in some circles because people say, well, there's all these different worlds, you can't measure them, it's not really science, right? Exactly like that. But what I'll be trying to explain is that many worlds is actually much, much simpler and straightforward than the ordinary textbook Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. And in particular, all of those worlds that you get out of many worlds are not the point. They're not the beginning point of this theory. They are a prediction of this theory, but they are not the central assumption. What Everett says is that there's no division of the world into classical and quantum. Everything is quantum mechanical, including you, the observer. So you have a wave function or you are part of the wave function of the universe. He says there's no such thing as collapse of the wave function, that ill-defined thing just doesn't exist. All that exists is evolution of the universe according to the Schrodinger equation, just like you have most of the time in regular quantum mechanics. It appears that wave function collapses, but Everett claims you can explain that, and I'll explain how that happens. And then the, the thing that you have to accept to get all this pretty deterministic evolution is that the other alternatives that you could have gotten in the quantum measurement still exist, but they exist on other branches of the wave function. So in other words, here we can, uh, we, we can tell the difference between textbook quantum mechanics and Everettian quantum mechanics. Here is textbook quantum mechanics. This is sort of the same thing I already told you, but in slightly more technical language. There's a space of states, Hilbert space, there's a Schrodinger equation, and this, the, I, don't, I do not mean by this just the non-relativistic Schrodinger equation for multiple particles. Any quantum theory has a Schrodinger equation attached to it, whether it's quantum field theory, quantum gravity, whatever you want. For some Hamiltonian, there is some equation that tells you how the quantum state evolves, and it's this equation, h psi equals i d by dt psi, that's the Schrodinger equation. And then we teach our students that measurements associated with an operator A return eigenvalues of that operator. The probability of diff getting different answers is given by the Born rule, and after measurements, the wave function collapses. Now, Everett comes along and says, I have an alternative set of rules for quantum mechanics, and they say that there's a Hilbert space in the Schrodinger equation, so that part is exactly the same, but then he stops. There are no other rules. This is the wonderful simplicity and, and uh, uh, compactness of the Everett interpretation. He says, I can just erase all those bothers.
associated with quantum measure and I can still get the same empirical predictions, okay? That's gonna be the tricky part, getting the same empirical predictions. And the way that happens, I'm gonna tell you that story, the story in a modern language. So decoherence is gonna play a crucial role here. Everett himself didn't know about decoherence, but there's no reason for us not to take advantage of it since we know about it. The move that we make is to factorize, decompose Hilbert space into a system that we're gonna measure an apparatus that's going to do the measurement. And the apparatus could be, you know, a microscope, it could be a stern gerlach experiment, it could be a particle ex accelerator, it could be a person, it doesn't matter. That's the nice thing about the Everett interpretation. There's no special ontological status given to an observer. It's just a physical system that's going to interact with the system that we're going to observe, okay? And then finally, we have everything else. Because you know, you're all physicists. It's not a public audience, I don't have to tell you this. When you have a quantum system composed of multiple pieces, there aren't separate wave functions for each piece. There's one wave function for the composite system, and there are factors in Hilbert space describing them all at once because the subsystems can be entangled with each other, okay? So if you're doing it properly, whenever you talk about quantum mechanics, you should include the possibility that everything else in the world is going to entangle with you. And that's what we call the environment. The environment is, in this case, everything else in the world, including you know, all the photons in the room that might be uh, hitting your apparatus as you go about measuring it. Okay, So all, everything you're not keeping track of. And then the process of measurement is that you start in some ready state which means in blue here, your system, maybe it's a spin that is a qubit, spin up and spin down. It starts in some superposition. Both the apparatus and the environment are in some fixed state. So there's no entanglement here when you start in the ready state between the system, the apparatus, and the environment. But then you measure, you, you, you what, might, what we call pre-measure, okay? So the apparatus, becomes entangled with the environment. The apparatus looks at, the, sorry, becomes entangled with the system, I should say, sorry about that. It looks at the system, there's some physical interaction. This is 100% governed by the Schrodinger equation, no magic, no collapses, nothing like that. And entanglement is very natural and is described by some Hamiltonian that tells you how the system evolves. And then the apparatus, unlike the system, which might have been some tiny macroscopic thing and can avoid becoming entangled with the environment, the apparatus is taken to be something macroscopic, right? Something that has a pointer with an actual arrow that goes back and forth. And so that is immediately going to become entangled with the environment. The photons in the room will reflect differently off the pointer, depending on whether it's pointing one way or the other. So that is the process of decoherence. Decoherence is the process where a quantum mechanical system becomes entangled with its environment. And the difference between Everettian quantum mechanics and Copenhagen quantum mechanics is that decoherence is just ordinary Schrodinger evolution. It's not a different kind of evolution. We don't need to invoke wave function collapse or measurements or anything like that. And this, I claim, explains, you know, in the context of the Everett interpretation, this explains what happens when you make a quantum measurement, okay? So after you've done this process of becoming entangled with the system you're measuring and then becoming entangled with the environment, the apparatus splits into preferred states, okay? Uh, this, is a, this is where we invoke Schrodinger's cat, right? This famous thought experiment. And Schrodinger set up his thought experiment so that uh, if there was some quantum probability that a, uh, a hammer would fall and break a vial of gas, there'd be cyanide poison that would kill the cat in one part of the wave function. The cat would be alive uh, in the other part. I see no reason to kill the cat, so I replace the cyanide with sleeping gas. And we get exactly the same physical system, except we are describing the cat as a superposition of awake and asleep, rather than alive and dead. But the point of this, for, the, for Everett's uh, purposes, is that we know, Schrodinger knew, and was trying to make a point, that when you open the box, you never see the cat in a superposition. Okay? You always see the cat either awake or asleep. And this is why the Everett interpretation is not obviously true, because Everett says, the cat will evolve into a superposition of awake and asleep, but we never see that, right? That's what we have to confront. So at this level, what decoherence is telling us is that the environment becomes entangled with certain specific states in certain specific ways. There's a preferred basis for the macroscopic system, and the macroscopic system, in this case the cat, uh, the preferred bases are those in which there is some special 
here thing that you can call the shape and the location of the macroscopic system. That's why the awake cat that is running around inside the box and the asleep cat that is lying down on the floor are the two preferred basis states for a cat inside the box. This process of measurement is fundamentally out of equilibrium. It, can, it, it starts with a certain very, very special state where there's no entanglement, then it goes to a state where there is entanglement. So the entropy of the system, the von Neumann entropy of the system, the entanglement entropy has increased over time, okay? And finally, this is crucially important. These two states that I've indicated here for the environment, E plus and E minus, you can show mathematically that in a robust sense, very, very rapidly, these states become orthogonal to each other. You know, Hilbert space is very, very big. So it's very easy for two states to be orthogonal to each other. Um, if you have a box of photons with, uh, you know, uh, Avogadro's number of photons, and you just add one photon to that box, instantly the state of the photons is orthogonal to what it used to be. So you don't have to work hard to make states orthogonal to each other. Uh, or even if you just have one photon and it moves in a different direction, that, that state is now orthogonal. So these environment states were orthogonal, and what that means is there is no longer any chance of quantum interference between what's happening in the plus part of the wave function and what's happening in the minus part, okay? So these two parts of the wave function, this was Everett's brilliant insight, they no longer interact with each other they go forward in time in completely independent separate ways. So whatever it suggests is the reason why you never think that you saw a cat awake, a cat being in a superposition of awake and asleep is because once that decoherence happens, there are, is now two cats. There's a cat that is awake and a cat that is asleep and they're located in different parts of the wave function which act as separate, distinct, non-interacting worlds. And that implies that you have two copies of yourself. And the reason why you think there's a probability of seeing a cat either awake or asleep is because both things become true. There's a version of you that sees the cat awake, there's a version of you that sees the cat asleep, and you can assign a different weight to those two probabilities. And this is where things become you know, tricky for the Everettian, okay? And, and this is something where, uh, you know, there is legitimate worries. There's silly reasons to object to Everettian quantum mechanics, but there's also very good worries that you should be thinking about. The origin of probability in Everettian quantum mechanics is a completely legitimate worry because unlike the Copenhagen interpretation, in Copenhagen you just state as an assumption that wave functions collapse with the probability given by the Born rule, right? That's one of the axioms of quantum mechanics. In Everettian quantum mechanics, there's no room for such an axiom. The axiom is that the Schrodinger equation is always true. That's it, right? There's nothing else is going on. So it's perfectly deterministic. The Schrodinger equation is deterministic. You can evolve the state forward or backward in time. Laplace's demon is perfectly happy with an equation like that. So why in the world is there probability at all in this kind of setup? And this is an ongoing argument, but I think that we know what the answer is. Uh, the answer comes from something called self-locating uncertainty. And the point is that that decoherence, that branching of the wave function into different branches that are orthogonal and define separate worlds, happens really, really rapidly. Again, it's a, it's a physical process. You can run the equations and figure out how quickly it is. It's typically something like 10 to the minus 20 seconds for a macroscopic system interacting with a bunch of photons or something like that. So it happens so rapidly that for human purposes, it might as well be instantaneous. It might as well be right away. So if you follow, this is a slightly more colorful version of the same uh, process we were looking at before. Here's a cat in a superposition. There's an apparatus that's observing it, uh, represented by the eyeball. Maybe it's your actual eyeball. Maybe it's a stern gerlach experiment or something like that. And there's the observer. The process of decoherence entangles the apparatus with the uh, system that it's looking at, and that happens so quickly that you don't notice it. And what that means is, uh, what I should say is it happens before you notice it. Let me put it that way. What that means is there are already two branches of the wave function. There are two copies of you, and these two copies of you are exactly identical, okay? So there are two copies of you, and neither one of them know 
which one dog up on branches, but they don't know yet. They could look and find out very, very quickly, but there's always a little moment when they don't know. And if they, if they were to asked in, if they were to be asked in that moment, what is the probability you're on one branch or another, they wouldn't have anything better to do than to assign some probability to it, okay? And then that's the easy part, to say that there is this sort of uncertainty that they need to assign a probability. And then the hard part is arguing that the probability they assign is given by the Born rule. It's given by the amplitude squared. But you can do that. You know, I've written papers uh, with Chip Stevens, who is my colleague here at Caltech. Uh, there are very sensible arguments you can give that the only thing, the only rational way to behave in the, this situation of self-locating uncertainty is to assign born rule credences to being on one branch or another. So it's a shift in the usual way we think about things. We think about probability as being like a frequency of something happening over and over again, an objective fact about the world. Here, probability is epistemic. That is to say, it's about your knowledge of the world. It's not about objective facts about the world. Okay, It's about where you are in the world. You can know the wave function perfectly and still not know where you are in it. But if you go through the math, all of it works out in exactly the same way. So it's a shift of how we think about it, but none of the operational facts change in any important way. Now, as compelling as all that is, not everyone agrees. There are alternative takes on this. And I'm going to explain this to you because a lot of people don't appreciate that this is not interpretations of quantum mechanics. This is not philosophy of science. These are different scientific theories with in principle testable consequences. And there are in fact laboratories that are right now testing them, okay? So this is clearly just ordinary physics as we know and love it. So one alternative is that there are hidden variables, right? Um, this is an old idea. Einstein was fond of it. Louis de Broglie was very fond of this idea. Schrodinger uh, played with it. And the idea is that the wave function is real, but it's not all that is real. Over and above the wave function, there are also literally positions of particles, right? And the wave function guides the positions of the particles. But when you make a measurement of particles, you're actually seeing their positions. Now, a lot of people have been taught that John Bell disproved that hidden variables can exist, but that's not exactly right. Bell's theorem, what it shows is that local hidden variables cannot exist. Or what I should say is a theory of hidden variables cannot be strictly local. So that's fine. You have non-local hidden variables. The variables themselves are local. They're positions of the particles, but they interact non-locally via the wave function. That's the way that these Bohmian theories work. And it's 100% compatible with the data as of right now. You know, we're trying to come up, no one has yet proposed a good experiment to test the differences between Bohmian mechanics and Everettian quantum mechanics, but the alternative is there and it's a different physical theory. There's different equations, different uh, particles and so forth. It's, it's clearly a different physical theory, not just a different interpretation. And the other one I want to mention is the idea that collapses are real. So Bohmian mechanics, just like Everett, is 100% deterministic. Right? It's just that we don't know what the positions of the particles are. Bohme, uh, spontaneous collapse theories actually take the idea that there are random collapses of the wave function and make that objectively real. Okay, So there are a couple of different ways to do this. There's a theory called GRW in which wave functions collapse just randomly. Right, like For every electron in the universe, there's a probability per unit time that its wave function will spontaneously localize somewhere. The other option is that these uh, collapses of the wave functions are triggered by some feature of the wave function. So Roger Penrose has a theory where when the energy of two different parts of the wave function differs by the Planck scale, there's a sudden collapse of the wave function. But in either theory, this is truly random, okay, is no longer deterministic, and you're, you're violating a very, very, uh, you know, very, very, what, what should I say? principles of physics that we're very fond of, okay? Like conservation of energy is obviously violated in these theories. The wave function changes spontaneously. And so that gives an experimental handle. You can absolutely test these theories and testing them is going on right now. And so if you found evidence for one of these theories, uh, Everettian quantum mechanics, the many worlds theory would be falsified immediately, right? So it's a very falsifiable theory. If people worry about, you know, 
is it is it possible to test all these other worlds? Also, you're buying these kinds of spontaneous collapses. There you go. So, in other words, just to sort of recap where we are, this is like I'm ending the first half of the talk and moving on to the second half, uh, the introduction to Everett part. Uh, many worlds is not a theory of quantum mechanics where you've taken good old quantum mechanics and added a bunch of worlds to it. It's a theory where you start with good old quantum mechanics and you take it seriously. You say there is a wave function. That's what represents reality. It's a vector in Hilbert space, mathematically speaking. All wave functions ever do is obey the Schrodinger equation. There aren't spontaneous collapses, random numbers, or anything like that, okay? The reason why we seem to get definite outcomes for measurements rather than finding ourselves in a superposition is because when macroscopic systems get into superpositions, they instantly become entangled with their environment, they decohere, and the wave function branches to describe separate worlds that no longer causally interact with each other, okay? So that's the good news. The good news is we seem to have a way of thinking about quantum mechanics that answers all of those worries that we had before. Remember the worries were, what do you mean by a measurement? When does it happen? Why is it probabilistic? Stuff like that, right? The measurement problem of quantum mechanics. Well, Everett answers all of those. A measurement is when a quantum system decoheres, when it becomes entangled with its environment. The probability comes from self-locating uncertainty and so forth. So we've answered all those questions. Unlike textbook quantum mechanics, Everett is a perfectly well-defined, rigorous physical theory, okay? That's the good news. The bad news is that if you step back from our experiments, you know, the, the, the stuff that inspired us to invent quantum mechanics in the first place, and you say, okay, what, where has that led us? And, you know, it's led us to this lean and mean theory of the world where there's a vector in Hilbert space evolving according to the Schrodinger equation. But then you say, all right, I wanna connect that back to the world I see, the world where there are, there's things like space and fields and tables and chairs for that matter and planets and stars, right? Um, in classical mechanics, you say from the start, well, okay, the world is made of some particles, some fields, whatever. That's not what you say in quantum mechanics. You say the world is a wave function. That's whatever it would say, okay? And so you say, well, a wave function of what? That's the, that's the challenge, we have to figure that out. So in other words, what I'm proposing, and this is, you know, to be super duper fair, what I've told you so far is a very standard Everettian story. So people who believe the many worlds uh, interpretation would follow me with everything I said so far. But now I'm going a little bit farther than most other people go. I'm saying that still, even though, you know, people accept this many worlds framework, they still cheat a little bit. They still smuggle in um, some pre-existing knowledge of the classical world. Because, you know, when we talk about wave functions, right, if you look down here at the purple, um, we often talk about psi of x, right, the wave function of the position of a particle, or the wave function of some spins or some quantum fields or whatever. But, that's sort of sneaking in a pre-existing classical notion of what it is we're talking about. When physicists build new models, whether it's of some condensed matter system or some inflationary cosmology or whatever, what do we do, right? We write down a Lagrangian or a Hamiltonian that could be thought of as perfectly classical, and then we quantize it. We've all been taught the rules for taking a classical system and quantizing it, turning it into a quantum mechanical system, okay? Presumably, nature, reality, does not do that, does not start with a classical system and quantize it, right? Nature just is quantum mechanical from the start. So nature doesn't know about this classical action or Lagrangian or whatever that we then quantize. What it knows about are vectors in Hilbert space, okay? So what we human beings tend to do is to start with a classical configuration space, X, okay? And then we consider the space of all square integrable complex valued wave functions. And we say that forms a Hilbert space, that forms as a complete normed vector space, okay? But if you're more intrinsically in tune with how reality works, you should start with the vector space. And then you, then you should ask yourself, why does it make sense for me to represent these vectors as complex valued functions over some configuration space, 
right? Maybe I can do that, but look, we all know there is an enormous amount of non-uniqueness in how we represent wave functions. For one thing, you could just go to momentum instead of space. So you start with position space rather than momentum space. In fact, there's literally an infinite number of things you can do. As you do any giant unitary transformation um, is, is allowed in Hilbert space. The, the choice to represent your vector in Hilbert space as a function on configuration space is essentially a choice of basis in Hilbert space. And you know from linear algebra, you can choose many, many different bases and it's not supposed to matter, right? The point of vector spaces is that the choice of basis is not important. Your predictions, your physical theory should be independent of that choice. So where did this come from? This, this thing called configuration space, this thing called position that we, uh, that we use to make our wave functions, okay? So the challenge for the Everettian is to start with purely, truly quantum mechanical notions like vectors in Hilbert space, entanglement, factorizations and so forth, Hamiltonian operators, and derive how all the classical world emerges. So uh, my collaborator Ashmead Singh and I call this mad dog Everettianism because this is the most extreme form of Everettianism you can imagine. You start with a Hilbert space, you start with a Hamiltonian and a state. That's it. And a state is a vector in Hilbert space. It's not a function on some configuration space. So you have a Hilbert space, a Hamiltonian, and a vector, and you derive everything else, including space itself. So you don't have a lot to start with. You have a very meager collection of data, right? You have the dimensionality of Hilbert space. You have the energy eigenvalues, the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. You need a Hamiltonian to get things going, right? You don't have any preferred basis or preferred uh, way of thinking to express that Hamiltonian. So really what the Hamiltonian is, is just a collection of energy eigenvalues, right? You, you can't say, well, the Hamiltonian is a set of derivative operators, uh, you know, position and, and uh, momentum operators on some space. That's what you're supposed to be deriving. So the Hamiltonian is literally just a set of energy eigenvalues. And finally, you might have the state itself, right? You might start with, you might be doing cosmology. So you start with an actual initial state. Maybe Stephen Hawking told you what it is. And then you have the amplitudes for that state in the energy eigenbasis, and you can go from there. Sorry. So this is um, I have a question. Yes. Um, why did you assume that the Hilbert space is finite dimensional? Well, I, I haven't yet, but I'm going to argue that you that you should. So if you hang with me, I will explain that in just a little bit. Okay. You know, in principle, there could be an infinite number of those energy eigenvalues. And then you would talk about the spectrum as a smooth function. That's okay. Um, there's no, as yet, I did not actually make that assumption, but I will be making it. Um, okay, so what I want to do for the rest of the talk then is talk about two themes that uh, I and my collaborators have been following using this framework, right? Using the idea that this is our job, uh, building up all of physics from its most basic constituents, Hamiltonian and the initial state, okay? And the two themes are, first I'm gonna talk about cosmology a little bit, uh, quantum cosmology in Hilbert space. So rather than starting with a metric and some fields and doing sort of quasi-classical cosmology, which is a very traditional thing to do, uh, what I'm going to do is just start with a vector in Hilbert space and ask what we can learn about the behavior of the universe on the largest scales. Uh, the second theme is gravity, right? You know, we all know that one of the big challenges is deriving a quantum theory of gravity. So I'm going to be suggesting that one of the reasons why that's been so hard for so long is because we always start with classical gravity and quantize it. And what we should be doing is starting with quantum states themselves and finding curved space time within it rather than going the other way around. Okay, so here is a little uh, finder's chart for quantum cosmology. Remember, I didn't give you that much information yet. I said, you know, there's a Hamiltonian and a state, right? There's, and so Hilbert, sorry, Hilbert space, Hamiltonian and state. So what can you say possibly about the long-term fate of the universe just on the basis of that meager information? Well, it turns out you can say quite a bit, okay? So there's basically four choices, uh, depending on two questions you can ask. One question, as was just uh, addressed, is the dimensionality of Hilbert space finite or infinite? Okay, so it, if it's finite, it's some number. If it's infinite, it's infinity. And the other question, which comes up immediately when you do cosmology is, 
is the universe in a zero energy eigenstate or is it in a combination, a superposition of many different eigenstates, right? If you take general relativity and you quantize it, um, what comes out of the quantum mechanics of a closed universe is the DeWitt equation. And the Wheeler-DeWitt equation does not say h psi equals i d by dt psi. It says h psi equals zero, okay? So that's assuming a certain form for h acting on the metric, the three-dimensional metric of space and its, its uh, conjugate momenta and so forth, and the th same thing for the fields. But the Wheeler-DeWitt equation doesn't take the form of an evolution equation over time, okay? So that's the top row here is the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, h psi equals zero. In that case, well, if the dimensionality of H is finite, uh, it wouldn't, sorry, let me say it this way. When H psi equals zero, time must be emergent, right? You know, you, you might say, if you're, if you're not a, a cosmologist and you're not familiar with the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, you might instantly say, well, wait a minute, H psi can equal zero because that says there's no time evolution in the state. And I know about time evolution. I have a clock in my office. I see it ticking, right? So it's ruled out by experiment. But the people who do this for a living say, look, H psi equals zero, so you don't have fundamental time evolution. But what you could have is emergent time evolution. So what you do is you factorize Hilbert space into a clock and the rest of the universe. And then you say the clock is entangled with the rest of the universe. And the state of the rest of the universe effectively evolves depending on what the reading of the clock is. And this has been worked out uh, over the years. I think there's still a lot of unanswered questions about this idea, but the idea is you can get effective time evolution in quantum gravity as an emergent phenomenon rather than a fundamental phenomenon. What that means immediately though, if you live in a finite dimensional Hilbert space, because you're getting emergent time from, subs from some subsystem of Hilbert space, there are only a finite number of ticks of the clock, okay? This emergent time cannot go on forever. So if you have h psi equals zero, time is emergent, and a finite dimensional Hilbert space, you instantly know that the universe truly had a beginning and will truly have an end. Or at least you know there's only a finite lifetime for the universe. It might be cyclic, right? It might just go around in a circle, in which case it's not a beginning or an end. But there's only a finite number of moments in the history of the universe. Whereas if the dimensionality of Hilbert space is infinite, then you can actually have an infinite tick number of ticks of the clock. And there, the question of whether or not time uh, had a beginning or not is still open. You can sort of do it either way. There's different questions you can ask. And that's actually the traditional uh, approach like that Stephen Hawking and Jim Hartle would have done in quantum cosmology papers that they wrote in the 80s. The other possibility, you know, look, the possibility that I'm exploring here is general relativity is just an approximation. We shouldn't be quantizing general relativity. So the idea that you quantize general relativity and get the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, maybe that's been misleading us. Maybe there really is a different Hamiltonian that we don't yet know about, according to which h psi equals i d by dt psi, okay? According to which there really is time evolution of the quantum state. In that case, time is fundamental. And if time is fundamental in the Schrodinger equation, again, you instantly get a result, namely the time is eternal. The Schrodinger equation, unlike general relativity, the Einstein equation, the Schrodinger equation never hits singularities. It's a linear equation. You can solve it exactly in terms of the energy eigenvalues, right? E to the minus I omega T for every different energy eigenstate. So Schrodinger equation instantly says that the wave function of the universe will evolve forever, at least in the Schrodinger equation's time variable. So the universal is eternal in this picture. And then it matters a lot whether or not the dimensionality of Hilbert space is finite or infinite. If it's finite, then you have a problem. <laughs> if you have a finite Hilbert space and an infinite time, then the universe will recur over and over and over again. It will cycle through uh, the, the same thing over and over again. And then you run into what's called the Boltzmann brain problem. Almost always the universe should be in thermal equilibrium. And wow. when it deviates from thermal equilibrium, small deviations are more probable than large deviations. The universe we're in right now and the universe we were in near the Big Bang is a huge deviation from thermal equilibrium. The entropy is very, very small. Uh, yes? Uh, there is an interrupting. 
because there is some noise is coming out. So I told everyone that please mute your microphone. Someone has to mute the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a very problematic. Please micro. Please mute the microphone. Please, like, otherwise we can't concentrate. I didn't. Uh, okay, yeah. microphones have been muted. Yeah. Good. So um, anyway, I think that the, the 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 box here in the lower left, where the Hilbert space is finite dimensional and uh, time goes infinitely far, that's very problematic. It'd be very very difficult to make that work. But if Hilbert space is infinite dimensional, then you can get out of it. Okay, then there is a way that you can avoid the recurrence and the Boltzmann brain problem just by saying that the universe never recurs. It, it lasts forever, but the recurrence time is also infinite. So it is always changing. And that offers, that's an interesting, you know, set of possibilities right there all by itself to understand the origin of the low entropy of the early universe and the arrow of time problem. Um, but that's a whole other colloquium. So I'm not going to talk about that right now. I'm just saying that there's this interesting finding chart for possible cosmological scenarios just on the basis of the size of Hilbert space and the nature of the Schrodinger equation long before we ever get to details about what the fields are or what quantum gravity is or anything like that. So let me, let me but having said that, let me go into what some of the, those details are, okay? So given this finding chart, you might wanna know, is Hilbert space finite dimensional or infinite dimensional? Well, I don't know what the answer to that is, but what I'm gonna argue is that we have a good reason to think that it is locally finite dimensional. What I mean by that is the, quantum mechanical description of some finite sized region of space should be thought of as finite dimensional, not infinite dimensional, okay? So take a region of space, maybe a big one, maybe our observable universe, or maybe a small one right here in front of your face, and ask how many degrees of freedom are there in there? What is the dimensionality of the Hilbert space describing that region of space? According to quantum field theory, the answer is infinity, okay? There's a infinite number of quantum field modes inside every region of space. And that's true even if, so you have a region of space, let's say this big, okay? So you have an infrared cutoff, it's only this big. You can say, well, I wanna put an ultraviolet cutoff also. So let me consider only modes in my quantum fields that are larger in wavelength than the Planck distance, okay? Than the Planck length, right? You say, well, maybe quantum gravity is a cutoff in the ultraviolet. So you say that then there's only a finite number of modes, right? But that's a little bit too sloppy because every mode, at least in the free field approximation, every mode is a simple harmonic oscillator, right? So every mode of the quantum field, even with UV and IR cutoffs, has an, by itself an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. A single harmonic oscillator has an infinite dimensional Hilbert space because the number of energy levels goes on up for infinity. But there's another cutoff and the cutoff is from gravity. Okay, because if you imagine that we have this, uh, these modes inside the finite region, the reason why there's an infinite number of possible states for every mode is that the energy for any mode can become infinitely big or can become, is unbounded, let's put it that way. But in a theory with gravity, that is to say in the real world, we know that's not exactly what happens because if you try to excite a mode inside a box to too high of an energy, the whole thing just collapses into a black hole. And if you keep doing it, if you keep trying to put more energy in, then the black hole becomes bigger than the region you're looking at. So if the question you ask yourself is, how many independent things can happen strictly in a finite sized region of space, the answer is only a finite number of things because eventually you will make a black hole and that, that's the biggest, that's the most you can do in that region. So this argument was formalized by Jacob Bekenstein. So it, it's based on what we call the Bekenstein bound, okay? There's only a finite number of things that could happen in a local region of space in a theory with gravity. And therefore we expect that the entropy, that the, that the dimensionality of Hilbert space describing that finite region is itself finite dimensional. And this is by itself, you know, this is something, again, we just argued this very sort of easily, right? Like we didn't work that hard. We didn't solve any complicated equations. But the implications of this are truly fundamental because it's saying that quantum field theory is not right, is not the final answer. You know, quantum field theory says very, very immediately there's an infinite dimensional Hilbert space in every region. 
and gravity says that there's not. So even without doing complicated uh, calculations with renormalizing non-renormalizable operators or whatever, you instantly know that quantum gravity, or at least you, you, you are you yourself into thinking this quantum field theory. It has to be something else. And we even know what the size of Hilbert space is, okay? Right? It's not just that it's finite. We actually think we have a good idea of what it is. Uh, black holes are not just, you know, the most energetic thing that we can fit into a region. We also think that black holes are the highest entropy that we can fit into a region with the, uh, with, uh, in a theory that has gravity as well as other things. So we know what the entropy of a black hole is. Bekenstein and Hawking gave it to us. It's the area of the event horizon in Planck units, okay? And if you know that you have a quantum system and you know that the entropy of that quantum system is maximal, that's a crucial thing, not, you know, other quantum systems might be different, but if you know that it's in its maximum entropy state, then the entropy is related to the dimensionality of Hilbert space. It's not exact because it depends on the temperature of the system and things like that, but there is a relationship and the, the relationship is roughly that the dimensionality of Hilbert space is e to the entropy, okay? So the entropy of black holes are, is very big. The black hole, the center of our galaxy, the Sagittarius A black hole has an entropy something like 10 to the 90th, it's a big number. The dimensionality of Hilbert space describing that region is therefore E to the 10 to the 90th, okay? So it's a dry humongous number, but still finite. Now, that doesn't say that the Hilbert space of the universe is finite dimensional because we're saying that the Hilbert space of any region of space is finite dimensional, but we're not saying there couldn't be an infinite number of regions of space, right? But again, we don't know. And what we do know is that we can only observe a finite part of our region of space. So what this suggests, yes? Oh, sorry. sorry, may I ask you a question? I think you just did what, uh, you, I mean, you said that we should not do this uh, uh, to go back to the classical uh, phase space and try to, mm. to make, and then you're, this is exactly what you're doing now. I mean, you, 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 you pick this three dimensional space and the time is external and then you're counting the modes inside this space, which doesn't yes, seem- that's Completely fair, you caught me, but let me explain uh, what the logic here is. Um, I, I, I do want to eventually start from just a wave function in Hilbert space and derive space and, and time and all those things, but I'm not going to be reluctant to use the fact that I know some things about what I want to get out of that, right? So what I'm doing right now is asking the question, should my starting point be an infinite dimensional Hilbert space or a finite dimensional Hilbert space? So what I'm using is semi-classical reasoning like Hawking's uh, calculation of black holes evaporating and the entropy of black holes, not because I think that's the right route to quantum gravity, but because it helps me fix the questions I need or the, the, the data that I need to start with. What is the dimensionality of Hilbert space? Is time fundamental or emergent? Stuff like that. And then once I do that, I will throw away my previous knowledge of classical space time. Thank I hope that's, that answers your question, but it's a good question. Okay, so what I wanted to conclude here with in this section is that um, this idea that there are only a finite number of degrees of freedom applies to our observable patch of space-time, right? We know from cosmology that we can only observe a finite part of the universe. And so I just wanna advertise a cute little theorem that uh, uh, Aidan Chatwin Davis and I proved. And other, this has been sort of a, something has been known informally by a lot of people for a long time, but there's something called the cosmic no-hair theorem, which says that if you live in a universe with a positive cosmological constant, like we think our universe actually has, then Bob Wald in the 1980s proved that if you just let it expand forever, there is a no hair theorem very similar to what you have in black holes. You know, in black holes, you can start with a lumpy uh, black hole, it will quickly radiate away all of its lumpiness and will settle down to the Kerr metric, a spinning black hole with mass and spin. Likewise, the universe, in the case, in the presence of a positive cosmological constant, might start with lumpy galaxies or you know, inhomogeneities, but it will radiate all those away, it will smooth them out, and it will approach empty de Sitter space, 
not anti de sitter space, which is negative cosmological constant, but empty, pure de sitter space, okay? So everything gets sort of evaporated away and pushed out beyond the horizon. The cosmic no hair theorem says that we will eventually approach de sitter space as our final state. And thinking about things from this sort of um, uh, finite dimensional point of view makes that cosmic no hair result resemble the second law of entropies, and eventually you hit equilibrium and then entropy stops increasing. So it suggests that we can think of the cosmic no hair theorem as having a thermodynamic origin, that this process of evolving toward de Sitter space is kind of like evolving toward equilibrium. And in that case, de Sitter space has a horizon and an entropy. We know what that is. So we can, again, calculate the number of degrees of freedom in our universe. So what we did was there is something called the generalized second law of thermodynamics, where you take something you call the generalized entropy, which is the entropy of ordinary matter, right, radiation and, and what have you, the ideal gas law or whatever you want to use to calculate the entropy, plus the entropy of a horizon. And there is a nice paper by Engelhardt and Busso where they define a specific kind of screen in an expanding space time on which you can do that. <coughs> and what we showed is that the evolution, if you, if you simply assume that this generalized entropy increases with time up to a maximum and it asymptotes to that maximum, then you can show that you approach de Sitter space even without using Einstein's equation. So it's a, it's a thermodynamic, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a result in thermodynamic and gravity, right? It's similar to what Ted Jacobson and Eric Berlinde and others have talked about with entropic gravity, thermodynamic gravity. We can derive a space-time result based purely on an argument from entropy. And the result is that you know what the entropy of our observable universe is. It's e to the area of our event horizon, which is about e to the 10 to the 120. So we have a picture then of what our what we're allowed to work with here in our uh, Mad Dog Everettian picture. We say that the observable universe is a factor of Hilbert space, which is finite dimensional. The dimensionality is e to the 10 to the 120. There might be a universe outside, which is either finite dimensional or infinite dimensional. That we don't know, okay? But that maybe we don't need to know. Maybe we don't care about that. There's certain questions for which you might care about that. But for since this is our observable universe we're talking about here, for many questions, you don't need to know the answer to that. So this goes back, this is supposed to be the answer to this question that was asked, you know, why am I cheating by using uh, features of space-time and things like that? This is the payoff of using that argument that we don't need to imagine that Hilbert space is infinite dimensional. If, we, if all we're trying to do is describe space time and its emergence within our observable universe, we can start with a finite dimensional part of Hilbert space. And that has a very important consequence because um, I don't want to go into this too much, but there is a, a really important um, mathematical difference between infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces and finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. In infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, there are different algebras of observables that you could choose that would define fundamentally different theories. So in an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, it's not true that you just tell me the dimensionality of Hilbert space, you tell me the Hamiltonian, and you're done. You also have to tell me the algebra of observables that you care about. Whereas in a finite dimensional Hilbert space, the things are much simpler mathematically, and the algebra, algebra of observables is just every Hermitian operator, okay? You don't have any choices in a finite dimensional Hilbert space. And that's even true if your finite dimensional Hilbert space is a subset of a bigger space. So this is where it really becomes important to be able to understand why we have certain preferred observables, why we have locality, things like that. That's something we should be able to derive from the underlying Hamiltonian, okay? So that was the quantum cosmology part. And now to finish up, I want to talk about the emergent gravity part. And let me mention that there is a whole Donna, very big... I have a question, sorry. Yeah, sure. So this external thing that you are pointing, it has some boundary? I don't know. <laughs> it's the rest of the universe. It is literally the part of the universe we can't observe. So I have no idea whether it's infinitely big or whether it has a boundary or whether it's finite. Okay. 
I leave that for future generations to figure out. Okay, so let me just, just mention that there's this large, very active research program on the emergence of space-time from quantum entanglement in the context of ADS-CFT, in the context of holography, okay? So this was pioneered by Brian Swingle, Mark Van Romstonk, and, and other people, and they show that if you have ADS-CFT and on the boundary in the conformal field, considered quantum entanglement, that directly affects the geometry of the emergent space-time in between. So by changing entanglement on the boundary, you change the geometry of space-time on the ADS side of the duality. I'm mentioning this because I'm not gonna talk about this. <laughs> this is very important, very interesting, very crucial, but I'm, I'm a down-to-earth kind of guy, despite everything I've been saying so far uh, in the colloquium, I care about the real world. I wanna know why the moon goes around the earth, and I wanna know why apples fall from trees, okay? And as a cosmologist, I know that we don't live in anti de -sitter space. We live in, if anything, something closer to de -sitter space. So even though it's very interesting and very important and very fruitful, to look at entanglement on the boundary of ads -CFT and derive important life lessons for gravity in the bulk, that's not what I wanna do. What I wanna do instead is just to look at world, the world in which we live, let's, let's call it the bulk, even though there might not be a boundary, okay? And ask whether we can derive features of gravity locally. And then we'll start simple. We'll start with just weak field gravity, okay? So we're not so ambitious as to worry about black holes or cosmology. I, I really wanna know why apples fall from trees from the point of view of emergent quantum space-time, okay? So again, I'm going to do the same philosophy, and I think I should have said this more explicitly. I'm going to use as a guidepost what I know to be true about the low energy phenomenological world. So we said that, you know, we know that there are black holes. That tells us something about the dimensionality of Hilbert space. We also know something about quantum field theory, and we will use that as an inspiration. So here's what we know about quantum field theory. Consider uh, a region of space that, well, let me say something that, that even predates quantum field theory. What if you didn't know about quantum field theory, right? You might say there's something called space, and space is basically empty, except that there are particles in space, okay? And the particles may or may not be entangled. That depends on the specific quantum state that you care about, and that's fine. But in this particle point of view, empty space is just empty. There's really nothing interesting to say about it. In quantum field theory, that's not true. In quantum field theory, okay, maybe you have particles, still you do have particles, but you also, even in empty space, have an enormous amount of stuff going on. The vacuum of any interesting quantum field theory is a very, very wild place. There's a lot going on. There are an infinite number of modes in very, very specific quantum states in the vacuum. And you can just divide up space, and this is very crude, and you can try to do it more in more sophisticated ways, but crudely speaking, you can divide space into little regions, and you can talk about what's going on in each region, including, you can ask, you know, are modes entangled with each other? What is the energy? What is the temperature? Things like that. What is the dimensionality of Hilbert space? So what we know, what we learn from our knowledge of quantum field theory is that, you know, we could factorize Hilbert space into a set of modes that represent different spatial locations, okay? And then what we think is true is that real quantum field theories have the feature that the Hamiltonian is local. What we mean by this, remember I'm, I'm taking the point of view where the fundamental equation is the Schrodinger equation, H psi equals ID by DT psi. And in quantum field theory, that H, that Hamiltonian, has the form an integral over space of a bunch of operators. And those operators have a location in space. Now that's, <coughs> excuse me, that is an extremely specialized form of Hamiltonian, right? It's very easy to write down non-local Hamiltonians. There's an infinitely larger set of non-local Hamiltonians than local Hamiltonians. So already in quantum field theory, we're saying that the Hamiltonian of the real world has a very, very specific, very, very special form. It is local in space. So let's turn that into, you know, let's convert that statement, the Hamiltonian is local in space, into a more purely quantum mechanical statement that doesn't rely on the existence of space. So the, the way that we do that is we say, let's subdivide space into all these regions. Let's 
port that over into Hilbert space by writing Hilbert space as a tensor product of smaller Hilbert spaces describing each region. And then without making explicit uh, reference to space itself, the locality of the Hamiltonian turns into K locality of the Hamiltonian, where K locality is a, a term borrowed from computer scientists, okay? Where they have circuits that, that can be local in, in some sense. Given this decomposition of Hilbert space into subregions, subfactors representing different regions of space, the Hamiltonian we decomposed into does any any one region as itself Hamiltonian, then has interactions with other regions. And if the Hamiltonian that we started with was local in space, the Hamiltonian in this discretization will have the feature that every region of Hilbert space, every factor of Hilbert space only interacts with a finite number of other factors of Hilbert space. Now you and I know that it's interacting with its nearest neighbors, right? That's locality. But the way of describing that without using the notion of locality is just to say every factor of Hilbert space only interacts with a finite number of other factors, a small number of other factors. There can be effective interactions built up by stringing together interactions. That is to say, I can talk to you even though you might be thousands of miles away, but the instant talking that I do only affects things right near me. That's locality of the Hamiltonian, okay? So there's this wonderful result by Kotler, Pennington, and Renard from a couple of years ago that if you start with just any Hamiltonian, okay, in some factorization, uh, actually, let, let me not say it that way. Take a Hamiltonian on a big Hilbert space, okay? Ask yourself the question. This, this first equation I wrote on this slide, that the Hilbert space is the tensor product into many little Hilbert spaces. Um, ask yourself, is there such a factorization in which this Hamiltonian that you handed me looks local? In other words, is there a factorization in which when I write the Hamiltonian in this factorization, the, there are only a finite number of interaction terms between what's going on in any one part of Hilbert space and, and other parts of Hilbert space. And the answer is a generic Hamiltonian has no local factorizations, okay? And now we are in quantum land. So now when I say Hamiltonian, I literally mean uh, the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, the set of energy eigenvalues. This is, this is for a finite dimensional Hamiltonian, but that's okay. Finite dimensional Hilbert space. So we're saying all you know is the energy eigenvalues. Is it possible to find a factorization into little pieces such that the interactions look local in that factorization? And the answer is no, generically. If you just give me a random Hamiltonian. But special Hamiltonians, special non-generic non Hamiltonians can be local. And what they prove is that when there is a local factorization, it's essentially unique. In other words, just from the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, you can derive the decomposition that we have right here, this, this H equals the tensor product of HA. There's a special decomposition in which the Hamiltonian looks local. I'm not gonna go through the argument, but the basic point is that in this way of writing the Hamiltonian in red here, the number of interaction terms, the number of, of, the, the number of uh, pieces of coupling constants, the data you need to give me, is much smaller in number than the energy eigenvalues. So only specific sets of energy eigenvalues allow for such a decomposition at all, okay? So in other words, in yet other words, sorry for the, this is taking a long while, but hopefully you get the point. Um, when it is possible to do so, I can in principle, go from a list of energy eigenvalues of a Hamiltonian to the right way to decompose Hilbert space so that it looks like space, so that it looks like a group of degrees of freedom that interact locally with each other. When that is possible, I can derive it just from the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. Okay, that's an amazing result. I'm very jealous because I was thinking about this myself and they got it before I did, so uh, good for them. Um, they're, they're young students and you should hire them if they apply to your, to your uh, jobs. And so, so you get a picture kind of like this. So starting from a completely generic vector space, Hilbert space, with a Hamiltonian on it, in other words, a set of energy eigenvalues and energy eigenvectors, there is a natural graph structure 
given by how to factorize the Hilbert space into smaller subfactors, which interact only with a finite number of other subfactors. Okay, so basically, they're telling you the topology of some kind of emergent space. I've drawn, I don't know, uh, 19 different little subfactors of Hilbert space here, but you should imagine there's a huge number, okay? And what you're deriving from this kind of interaction, there is a way in applied math, uh, there are ways to go from this kind of network structure. You can ask questions like, what is the dimensionality of this space? Is it one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional? Is it fractal dimensional? Something like that. So just the graph of the actions defines the topology of space, including its dimensionality. So you're beginning to see how space itself can be emergent from Hilbert space, okay? But all we have is the topology. Sorry, is can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, from like a two, two a slide before, uh, I mean, I'm asking about the uniqueness of this uh, representation of the yeah. Hamiltonian that you have. I mean, this is a little bit what we have usually in the condensed matter, right? So like a Coulomb interaction could be this, uh, the second term. Uh, yeah. So the question, so even that, even in that case, I can go to the real space or momentum space. Both cases, I have four fermions, for example, interacting with each other. So it's not really unique. So in which sense you are, you, you mean that the, the representation is unique? Well, the momentum space representation doesn't look local, right? Uh, position space looks local. That's the nice thing about the real world is that interactions are local in position space. So then you have already a notion of vicinity of the points of the Hilbert space. When you say well, that's that's what you're looking for. So if what you find is that there, you know, every factor has an interaction term with every other factor, then you say, okay, that's not local. The definition of local here is that every every factor only interacts with you know four other factors or something like that. Gotcha. And that that representation they show is essentially unique, up to like relabelings and simple things like that. Right. So that's, that's exactly the point. I mean, this is a very good question. I mean, what's the difference between position space and momentum space? The difference is that it is in position space that interactions look local. And that is derivable just from the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, which is, which is very cool. And what we want to do is go from that topology and dimensionality of space to a geometry of space. And now the, you know, these results from Kotler et al. were mathy and rigorous, right? They were published in the Journal of you know, Communications and Mathematical Physics or whatever. Now we're just gonna go into wild speculation land. Now we're, we're beyond what we're able to prove things for. What we're gonna put forward, what we're gonna try to do, the game we're gonna try to play is make some rules and say that under these assumptions, we get the result we want. And then we'll go back and try to actually show that the assumptions are true. So again, here's what we know from quantum field theory. We know that there is this sort of decomposition into regions of space and in the vacuum state of that theory, so no particles, forget about particles, just in the vacuum state, we know that the regions of space are entangled with each other. Nearby regions are highly entangled. Faraway regions have a low amount of entanglement. And uh, Sayantan, what is the time limit here? Am I I'm gonna run out or can I just talk for another 10 minutes? Oh, please, please continue because like uh, I want that you finish. Now, okay, if, I will finish, good. Yeah. I have about 10 more minutes, I think. Yeah, 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 um, perfect. The like upper bound is two hours. So you told me that two hours- Yeah, I won't hit that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, good. So again, using, you know, we're taking what we know from the real world as uh, uh, giving us a goal to shoot for. And the goal is in real space, the vacuum state has this property that nearby regions are highly entangled, faraway regions are entangled, but less entangled, okay? So entanglement is the kind of thing that we have to work with in this framework, but distance is not. So in quantum field theory, we would start with distance, the geometry of space, and we would derive the fact that there's a relationship between entanglement and distance. Here, what we're going to posit, what we're going to start you know, as an assumption is that we can start with entanglement and use that to derive a metric, 
derive a notion of the distance along a curve. So you have these discrete parts of Hilbert space and you can define a curve through them and you, can, you know in any one given quantum state, including the vacuum state, the lowest energy state, you know what the entanglement is between all of those features. So we can define an effective distance measure which says that if they're highly entangled, we call them close together. And if they're not very entangled at all, we call them far apart. Now again, for a generic state, this will be completely meaningless. This will not fit together in any nice way. But for a nice vacuum state, for a nice local Hamiltonian, this distance measure will fit together to define a metric on an emergent spatial manifold. So I talk sometimes about emergent space time, but actually I'm not gonna talk emergence of time anymore. For now, for the rest of the talk, it's all just the emergence of space. And the point is that the vacuum entanglement structure, which is something we're allowed to use in this approach, can be used to define an emergent spatial metric. So how do we do that? Well, von Neumann told us how to quantify entanglement. Uh, given two subsystems that have a, a pure state describing both of them, we can derive the density matrix for one or the other, and then we can calculate the entropy, right? And so the entropy is a, it's a measure of information. It's a, it's a measure of the, the ignorance that we have about the exact state that we're in. So if two subsystems are entangled, we know the state of the entangled uh, composite system, but not the individual states. There is no such thing as the wave function for one subsystem if it's entangled with the rest of the world, okay? So unlike classical mechanics, quantum mechanics gives us a notion of entropy that is kind of unavoidable, right? Uh, in classical statistical mechanics, you could always say, well, if I knew the position and momentum of every particle, then I could do everything exactly. I wouldn't need to talk about entropy. In quantum mechanics, I can know the wave function of a composite system exactly, but subsystems still have entropy because of entanglement. So we know, again, something that we know about uh, quantum field theory is that if you have a region of space, that entanglement is biggest between nearest neighbors, and therefore the entropy of the entire region is roughly given pretty, to a pretty good uh, approximation, actually, by the area. It's proportional to the area of the boundary of that region, right? So if mathematically, you can turn that around. Uh, if rather than knowing the distance along any curve, if you know the area of every region, the area of every co-dimension one region of space, that fixes exactly the geometry of the manifold, okay? So if, if instead of being explicitly given a geometry, I'm given the uh, entropy of a bunch of regions, then I can also equally well calculate uh, the, air, the uh, emergent geometry. So there's one way of doing it from distances. There's another way of doing it from areas. They give basically the same answer, okay? So what, so what I should say, no, sorry, I'm missing an important physics point here. Um, in a condensed matter system that is close to its vacuum state or in a quantum field theory that's close to its vacuum state, it is a true fact that if I take a region of space and calculate the entropy inside, it's proportional to the area. But if I'm not in the vacuum state, then it's not true, right? I can certainly consider a state in a field theory or a condensed matter system where there's no entanglement at all between what's going inside some region and outside somewhere else. It wouldn't be the vacuum state, it'd be some excited state, but there's no necessary connection between entropy and area in ordinary flat space, fixed background quantum field theory. So the conjecture, the non-trivial conjecture here, and I think that Ted Jacobson in 1955 was the, 1995 was the first one to state this explicitly, but others have uh, explored it also. The conjecture is that in a theory with gravity, when you take a quantum state that starts in its vacuum state and therefore entropy is proportional to area, if you perturb it, so if you add some energy to the state, okay, so maybe you break the entanglement between something inside and something outside. So you change the total entropy of the region. The conjecture is the area changes to compensate. So the conjecture is that in a theory with gravity, the fact that space-time is dynamical and is curved 
lets you say that entropy is always proportional to area in a way that it would not be true in a condensed matter system or quantum field theory in a fixed background, okay? Uh, they, they're saying that if you try to decrease or increase the entropy, the geometry changes to compensate to increase or decrease the area. This is a conjecture, but they give evidence for it, and it's actually quite reasonable given what we know about uh, gravity. So what we have under all these conjectures, and I know there's a lot of them, that's why it's you know not anywhere near done yet, this program. We're more sketching out a research program than filling in the details. Uh, we have a relationship between geometry and entanglement, okay? This is the, the, what, what, we're, what we're saying is true right here in the room, you know, not ADS, CFT kind of stuff, but in near vacuum states, weak field gravity, uh, in ordinary theories that are close to quantum field theory, which we think the real world should be, there's a definite relationship between geometry and entanglement. And conjecturally, but very plausibly, you can push that a little further, as Jacobson tried to do. There's also a relationship between entanglement and entropy, right? I mean, that's clear. We knew that. Von Neumann gave us that a long time ago. So the final thing that we would like is a relationship between entropy and energy, right? And it, depending on where you are in your, um, how you think about entropy, this may or may not be a natural thing to think about. But if you put yourself back in the shoes of the people in the 1800s who were inventing ideas of entropy, people like Carnot and Clausius, right? They would have thought that a relationship between entropy and energy is the most natural thing in the world, right? They would have written down an equation like this. The entropy is the integral of dq over t, the, the change in heat into or out of a system uh, at, in some thermal bath at temperature T, okay? So there's a bunch of people, uh, Faulkner et al., Jacobson also, who have derived something called the entanglement first law. Uh, and I'm not gonna go into the details here, but, this, but it's a, uh, if, you're, if this is the kind of thing you're interested in, I, I encourage you to look this up. It, it has to do with the modular Hamiltonian and other things you can define. There's a way of relating in, <coughs> just in quantum mechanics. So this is nothing, this is a, a law that you can prove in, in quantum systems with entanglement, that there is a relationship between the change of entanglement and the change in energy. The trick is you have to define what you mean by energy in a very particular way. That's where the modular Hamiltonian comes in. But anyway, you can define it and it makes sense. And it also, so I'm not gonna go through the mathematical details, but I, I would like to suggest that it makes sort of intuitive sense, right? Because what, what we've said is that in the vacuum state, there's this natural entanglement structure where nearby states, nearby degrees of freedom are entangled, far away ones are less entangled. That just makes sense to us. So Sorry. if we are going to change the entanglement structure from the vacuum state, that will necessarily correspond to putting energy into the system, right? Because we start in the vacuum state and we perturbed it. So the energy has nowhere to go but up. So it's very, very natural that there's a relationship between energy and entanglement in this way. Is there a question? Excuse me? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, when we talk about a uh, relation between ent entanglement and uh, geometry, does it work in same manner for every number of uh, dimensions or it changes? This relationship I'm talking about here is, again, purely quantum mechanical. There's nothing to do with the dimensionality of space. It's a, the, this entanglement first law is a, is a result you can prove in any quantum system uh, under the right assumptions, but you know, pretty, pretty general assumptions. I hope that gave you the answer, yeah. Are there other questions or should I keep going? Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, sir, I uh, wanted, so is there any generic form for how under small deformations? Uh... I think you faded out there, but I'm going to answer the question. Uh, so yes, the answer is, so uh, uh, <clears throat> this thing called the entanglement first law, I'm not going into details about it, but there are details. So there's a very, very specific formula for what you mean by the energy. Uh, derived from something called the modular Hamiltonian. I mean, so if you want a little bit more detail, here it is. Um, if you know what the Hamiltonian is of your system and you couple it to a heat bath, okay? So your system is in some thermal state. 
then you calculate its density matrix. It's a well-known fact that the density matrix of a thermal system looks like E to the minus beta H, where H is the Hamiltonian and beta is the inverse temperature. Beta is one over T, okay? So you have some density operator and it's, it's given by E to the minus beta H. But if you, are, if you don't know the Hamiltonian, or if you're given some other density matrix, okay, so you're given some density matrix that is not necessarily the thermal density matrix, I can always take the logarithm of it, <laughs> right? So for any density matrix rho, I can write it in the form e to the minus k, where k is some operator, right? And that k is minus the log of, of rho. So, and that's true for any uh, density operator, whether it's thermal or not. So I define that operator k to be what's called the modular Hamiltonian for this particular density operator. The Hamiltonian that the system would need to have in order for this particular state to be thermal. Not that it is thermal, but that's what it would need to be, the Hamiltonian would need to be. And it turns out that this operator, the modular Hamiltonian, has a lot of properties that are very much like ordinary Hamiltonians. And in particular, you can show that for certain quantum field theories, for certain conformal field theories in the infrared, uh, the modular Hamiltonian equals the regular Hamiltonian and things like that. So it's that modular Hamiltonian that takes, that plays a role in this entanglement first law. And I'm trying not to go into details about it because it takes us a little bit far afield, but the details are there. That's why you should read these, these papers if you want to look at them. Um, anyway, and it, it, it also makes um, uh, sort of intuitive sense that if you perturb the vacuum state, you're both changing the entanglement structure and you're changing the energy. So we have a relationship between geometry and energy, okay? So geometry is related to, um, Entanglement, entanglement's related to entropy, entropy is related to energy, so geometry of space is related to energy. But that is something we've been familiar with for a long time. The fact, the idea that the geometry of space is related to energy is just general relativity. It's just Einstein's equation, uh, poetically expressed, right? You know, here's actual Einstein's equation, curvature of space-time proportional to energy momentum tensor. So what we are able to do, my collaborators listed here and I, uh, you know, with all the details that I'm not giving you today, what we're able to do is to say, here's a list of assumptions, and we derive the fact that in this particular emergent space setup, under these assumptions, the specific detailed change in the geometry is in fact proportional to the change in the actual entropy, in exactly in energy, in exactly the way that Einstein's equations says. And there are huge challenges to making this program be complete. Um, we haven't derived, you know, Lorentz invariance is the obvious thing that we haven't derived. We picked a frame and worked in that and just assumed that at the end of the day, you're gonna get some Lorentz invariant behavior. That's a statement about specific features of the Hamiltonian and we're not sure exactly how to implement those in the way that we're able to implement locality and things like that. But there, does, there don't seem to be any roadblocks, right? I mean, the, the surprising thing is not that we got Einstein's equation because in some sense, Einstein's equation is the simplest relationship between geometry and energy that you could have that would be consistent. The interesting thing is that there is a roadmap to deriving space-time uh, from purely quantum mechanical ingredients. And when you do it, because your definition of geometry derives from the entanglement of these different parts of the wave function, that geometry is naturally dynamical, right? The geometry that emerges- May I ask a question? Yes. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe I'm confused, but uh, you're working in vacuum gravity right now, right? I mean, there is no uh, um, energy and momentum from some other source? No, no, we have energy and momentum, yeah. I see, so, okay. So yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. So, so if you have pure gravity, uh, I mean, uh, and you know that uh, energy is necessarily a boundary term. Uh, uh, I mean, somehow I'm not able to see, I mean, in this factorization, uh, uh, how, we, how, how that fact uh, is sort of captured. Well, say, say the fact again. I couldn't hear you. Uh, so, I mean, so in classical gravity, I mean, for any diffeomorphism invariant theory, the energy is necessarily a boundary term. Oh, yeah. That's right. Uh, um, yeah. No, that's right. That is not captured in anything that we've done. That is something that is going to have to emerge um, in a more sensible way 
which I, I, I would not claim that we have derived yet. Um, so I would say that's compatible, you know, uh, with everything that we've done, but I can't say that we've proven that it's true. I mean, I it's see. essentially, okay. you know, we want to show uh, the inverse square law for gravity uh, is the sort of rough and ready way of saying that. And uh, I think it's a very natural thing to pop out, but, and it, it does, but I think that I would say that it's, it does because of specific assumptions we've made along the way, not because of any robust feature that we uh, derived. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, good, so actually, let me just conclude. Here's my last slide. I just wanna remind you, because we went down a long road, okay? And uh, I wanna remind you, because there's a lot of, we, we know where we wanna go, so we went fast, uh, but there's a lot of steps that need to be fulfilled along the way. The idea is we start with a vector in Hilbert space, something very abstract, featureless, right? Like there's no, Hilbert space is a uh, structure on it. It's a vector space. All directions are created equal, except for this fact that there are energy eigenvectors, right? This gives us a, a preferred basis. And starting from that, we showed or we argued that you could decompose Hilbert space into factors, which in the back of your mind, correspond to regions of space with local interactions between them. And then we could use the entanglement structure of a nearly vacuum quantum state to define an emergent geometry on that uh, emergent space. And it's very natural for that emergent ge geometry to be dynamical because it depends on the entanglement. And if the state changes, the entanglement changes, okay? So it's not a, you know, in, from this perspective where you're deriving space from Hilbert space, the fact that space is dynamical is the least surprising thing in the world. You know, what else would it be, okay? And in fact, we can show that in the weak field limit, uh, the classical weak field limit, the relationship uh, under certain assumptions between geometry and energy is in fact given by Einstein's equation. So many issues remain. You know, I'm very enthusiastic about the program overall, but it's still very uh, young and, and fragile and it could break down at any time. Um, but I'd like the, you know, I'm, I'm most motivated not by the technical results, but by the underlying philosophy that we should take quantum mechanics seriously, that we should not start with the classical theory and quantize it. We should start with the quantum theory and try to emerge everything from that. It's ambitious, but I think it's a fruitful direction for future research. Thank you very much. So I would uh, ask the participants to ask questions to the speaker. And I, uh, before that, there are a few questions in the chat box. I just, I don't know whether... Uh, Let me see if I can find the chat box. Hold on. Uh, hello, sir. I have a question. Uh, so, okay. Uh, so, sir, uh, I have a system. Uh, we know the energy of that system. Uh, so uh, we can uh, relate it uh, to entropy. Uh, man, if I know the system uh, having a I uh, known energy, uh, then we can relate it to the entropy. Is it possible? Yes. Is it possible to relate uh, energy and uh, entropy? Oh. Uh, well. Um you know, not in general. So in other words, not in perfect generality, you know, I could have um, two systems, two, two, let, let's say I have a composite system, A tensor B, okay? And there's some Hamiltonian for them. Um, I could certainly imagine two different, completely different quantum states, one of which A and B are highly entangled and the other one of which A and B are not entangled at all in which in both states, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian is equal uh, in, the, in those two different states. So I would say there's not a necessary relationship between entropy and energy. They're two different ways of characterizing the state. But you know, all of these steps here, you know, there's a lot of assumptions, like I said, that go into them. So you know, we start with vacuum states, local Hamiltonians, small perturbations, weak field. You know, all of these things are important. So you don't, don't take the, the statements that I make as applying to any generic quantum system. They apply to the specific ones that I was uh, talking about here. Sir, when you talk about uh, this quantum system, uh, uh, then uh, we relate uh, this quantum system to the entropy. Uh, 
that uh, that you uh, Oh, you muted yourself. <laughs> Any hello? Yeah, hello. Uh, Sean, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Yeah, so uh, I am, uh, I would like to ask uh, one question regarding uh, the I mean, general philosophy of quantum cosmology. It's like from, I am a guy from uh, purely classical cosmology, like dynamical system analysis of uh, cosmological, uh, uh, I mean, scenarios. And uh, that is a very classical way of describing uh, the cosmology. So you have uh, Einstein field equation or whatever modified gravity equation, mm -hmm. and you do, by a classical analysis of the dynamics, and then you have a quantum way of describing uh, the universe, where you uh, assume that all the information about the universe is contained in a wave function, and it evolves according to the Schrodinger equation, right? Yes. Uh, Okay, they, uh, are these two approaches completely equivalent? Like uh, if I apply the same, I mean, the two approaches in, uh, uh, for example, that same scenario, uh, do they always uh, give the same result? No, not at all. <laughs> in principle, they can be very different results. Yeah, because I am asking you this question because uh, I have seen some, uh, I mean, papers in um, the literature, which, uh, I mean, they claim that there are some finite time future singularities which arise in classical analysis of the universe dynamics. But if you uh, take into account the quantum description by the wheeler dewitt equation and stuff, then these future, future singularities are smoothed out. So that's why I was uh, asking. So it does not necessarily give you uh, like equivalent result. No, that's right. I think that the classical dynamical systems approach uh, can be very useful in the classical limit. And when that approach tells you that you're going to hit a singularity, what it's really telling you is the classical dynamical approach is failing to capture what happens because it's, it's leaving the regime where it should be trustable. So the quantum approach there would be very different. So, uh, I mean, uh, that singularity, is, even if I get a singularity, I should not take this as something as a uh, uh, physically meaningful uh, I think the physical scenario. meaningfulness is that a classical singularity tells you the classical approximation has broken down. It does not tell you okay. anything about the behavior of the real system. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Sir, uh, I have a question. Can I Who is next? Sorry, maybe I go ahead. Uh, so first yes. of all, thank you for the interesting talk. My, my question is, uh, if I have a set of uh, entities in, in the Hilbert space and there is no metric uh, entity, so if I understood uh, based on uh, entanglement, like a, of the, let's say, ground state, uh, I could get an emergent metric of, yes. of the system. But, but so the question is that how can that, that uh, be the result of the Hamiltonian? The, I mean, there must be, the, the Hamiltonian must have a preference on which entities talk to each other. And by that, it, it or other, otherwise, I mean, it's, it's systems is, for example, it, it would be a, like a such type of a key type model, any system like at, at, the, at the criticality where all the points talk to each other and the, there is no preferred metric, right? So the preference must be encoded in the Hamiltonian. Yes, that's correct. The, the so the, the way the logic goes, um, you start with the Hilbert space with a Hamiltonian, Right. You ask yourself, is there a way to factorize the Hamiltonian, to write it as a tensor product of many little subsystems, such that uh, written in that basis, the Hamiltonian looks local, which means to say that each individual subfactor only interacts with a small number of other subfactors. Then 
in that basis, you solve for the ground state of the Hamiltonian, okay, and then you get some wave function written in that particular factorization, and you can calculate the entanglement from that wave function. And then you can ask yourself, okay, does the distance measure implied by that entanglement define a metric on the emergent space? And the answer is sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. When it does, you can ask these other questions about you know, uh, the dynamics of it and so forth. So, so, so the, the, the fact that the, there was already a preference in the Hamiltonian in that preferred basis by itself, that doesn't define a metric, you say? No, I mean, you know, the, um, the, the, the logic goes from Hamiltonian to locality, and then from entanglement to metric. I see. And then the Hamiltonian could be close to a criticality, for example, where, where then, then the, the ground asset doesn't uh, imply a metric. I, I, I well, the um e you know even so criticality is a statement about the state right? right not the hamiltonian like the hamiltonian in any in any let's say formal theory, formal field theory it's the it's an integral over d3x of some set of local operators or d2x or whatever uh the state that you get the ground is critical yeah the ground state yeah. might be critical so but the, the hamiltonian, hamiltonian is still local can be such that the ground state is close to the to the uh, to the critical uh, sure. criticality, or it could be topological order or something that so that I cannot really infer a metric from the from the uh, entanglement. Right? Yeah, it's possible. So again, we're none of these statements are anywhere close to generic, but that's good, right? And this is a feature of it, not a bug. You can always find examples where this program would not work. But that's good because we want to figure out what the features are of the Hamiltonian that gives rise to the real world that we know. Uh, and that we get to learn something about that by the fact that these, these behaviors are non-generic. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there is a, a raising hand. Faraz, that's a good question. Yes, hi. Hi there. Hello. Hello. Yeah, uh, are you able to hear me, Sean? You can, yes. Yeah, first of all, thanks Thanks for the presentation. I think it was wonderful, and uh, you did some very, very good points. Now, my, my question is around time. Now, in this scenario where, let's say, time is fundamental, it happens to be fundamental, where h size is not equal to zero. Now, in, in that case, I suppose it would mean that there needs to be a quantum unit of time. And in which case, do you think that this quantum unit of time could perhaps be described as the fundamental unit of entropy itself? So I would say, you know, what I have to say is not necessarily um, gospel or what anyone else would say. In my view, if time is fundamental, then there is no unit of it. It is smooth, it's a continuous variable. The, the Schrodinger equation that we all know and love has time as, uh, it's not an observable, right? It is not like uh, an operator on Hilbert space, it's a parameter that tells you where you are in Hilbert space. And so it is not itself quantized or anything like that. All right, fair enough. Uh, hello, may I ask a question? Yeah, please ask. Yeah, uh, so uh, you mentioned about uh, the ADSAFT correspondence and there's like, ultimately you told that there is a relationship between entanglement and geometry or entropy and geometry. Uh, and in the ADSAFT correspondence, there, there is a, already a conjecture, a similar conjecture uh, relating ent entanglement entropy to uh, space time uh, through the Ryu Takanagi formula. So do you think uh, this uh, formalism of yours uh, can lead to the same results as those, even though we are working in a digital space? Well, I think it's a very different regime in which these are supposed to apply to. So ADS-CFT um, is intrinsically holographic, right? It's the most holographic thing in the world. Um, and as I don't know what your background is, but as maybe you know, it is difficult, not impossible, but difficult to use ADS-C of T to describe physics on sub-horizon scales, sub-EDS yeah. length scales. Um, it's much better at describing the sort of global thing. And that, that makes sense because 
it's sort of in the most holographic limit. Likewise, if you described a black hole um, where you have a horizon there, et cetera, it's in the most holographic limit. It's, it's the regime in which locality is breaking down. Right, and so our results are all in the opposite limit. They're all in the limit in which the fields are weak and locality is still manifest and you can get local equations of motion for the emergent space-time metric field. So I hope that there is some theory that encompasses all of them, but the actual results we're getting are on different parts of a spectrum of limits. Yeah, right. Thanks. Next question, please, uh, Ali, please ask. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Sean, thank you for the lecture. Um, maybe just um, an argument when, when you were discussing about the finiteness of the Hilbert space, why does it only apply for locally? Uh, why, why do we have to emphasize only locally? Well, the evidence that we have um, comes from, the evidence loosely uh, there's no adventures the arguments that we have come from you know what can what are the number of different ways that you can excite quantum states in a region of space um, if I have an infinitely big space then there's an infinite number of ways that I can excite I put a wave packet here a wave packet there a wave packet over there so at least at this level of argumentation that we have available to us right now it's it seems most likely that an infinitely big space corresponds to an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Now that might not be how nature works, um, but that that's the argument that we have is only able to um, establish finite dimensionality for a finite region. I see. So for, for finite universes, we can speak global. then. Well, you know, yeah, there's, th this is stuff that is not, completely understood or agreed on. You know, there's um, this idea of horizon complementarity where when you have a horizon, whether it's cosmological or in a black hole, you could describe the information uh, of the quantum system either as being scattered locally in the bulk or as being holographically distributed sure. on the boundary. So for de Sitter space, that raises two different possibilities. We live in a bulk where we have an observable universe tens of billions of light years across, surrounded by a horizon. And so there's two possibilities. One is outside that horizon, space is, exists and is infinite and there's an infinite number of things going on, but we can only sort of be entangled with a finite amount of it because there's only a finite number of things going on in our region. The other possibility is that that universe in our bulk and on our horizon is literally everything, right? that what you might have thought of as the global larger universe is just holographically encoded on our horizon. Um, I don't know enough about quantum gravity to say whether one of these viewpoints is correct or not. Happily, I don't need to for anything I was talking about today. Thank you. Any more questions, Ali? That was good. Okay. Next, uh, Hako. Okay, you can hear me okay? Uh-huh. Yeah, I have a question. I, I'm sorry, I'm a amateur when it comes to these things. Um, I have a question about many world uh, interpretation. And specifically the, the criticism of it in the sense that it's reinventing the measurement problem rather than solving it. So that you have to, when you make a measurement and you ask in the many world interpretation, what is the probability of a specific outcome? It should always, in some sense, be one. But you have to choose a branch for which your detector is in them, and you have to calculate your the probability relatively to the branch that you have chosen. Do you have any counter arguments to this or any insights on this? And did my question make sense? Yeah, no, your question makes perfect sense. I would say that it's there's two different problems. It's not that Everett has reinvented the measurement problem. The, the measurement problem is just solved. A measure, because the measurement problem is simply the question, what do you mean by a measurement? When does a measurement happen? What is the physical process? And in Everettian quantum mechanics, it's perfectly clear what that is. A measurement is when a quantum system that's in a superposition becomes entangled with its environment and becomes decohered. That's the answer, okay? And it's all very physical and very based on the equations. But there is a new question, 
that you didn't have before. In ordinary quantum mechanics, the question of what is the probability of getting a certain measurement outcome was one of the axioms. So that we didn't ask a question about it, we just said that it was a, the wave function squared, the Born rule. In Everett, as you just said, there's different, there are different branches and different measurement outcomes happen on every branch. So in what sense is there a probability of getting one outcome or another? So I tried to make the argument here in the talk that the, the sense in which there's a probability is the sense in which the observers on those branches don't yet know which branch they're on. So they have to assign a probability to being on one branch or another. It's just like assigning a probability to who's going to win the World Cup, okay? Someone's going to win it, but we don't know, so we assign a probability to it. Likewise, when you're on a branch of the wave function of the universe, you don't know which one you're on, you assign a probability to it. And then you ask, well, what is the probability you should assign? And what you find out is it's given by the Born rule. It's given by the wave function squared. Hi, I have a question uh, regarding the previous question itself. Yeah, yeah, please, so, wait, yeah. please wait, because there are two people more. Okay, uh, Risha, please ask a question. Yeah, thank you, sir, for the wonderful lecture. I want to ask about the dynamical evolution of the universe described by the chaotic solutions to the Einstein field equation. Like, I'm talking about the BKL singularity. Can you tell, uh, tell me about something that? I cannot. I know almost nothing about that, so I have no no wisdom to give you there. Sorry about that. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Leo. Yeah. Hi. Um, there's one point that confused me, and um, so as much as I understood in your approach, you start with the Hilbert space, and there's no notion of space. Yes. Um, in which way do you, or how do you choose the frame of reference then? Well, good. So the, um, it's an interesting question. I don't yet know the full complete answer. So if you think about the Schrodinger equation, you know, the Schrodinger equation tells you how a quantum state vector evolves with time. Um, there's no obvious manifest appearance of anything like Lorentz invariance in the Schrodinger equation. But we know we can take a Lorentz invariant field theory, like electromagnetism or Klein-Gordon theory, and we can pick a Lorentz frame and write down the Hamiltonian in that frame and write down the Schrodinger equation. So the Schrodinger equation is completely compatible with the possibility of Lorentz invariance if the Hamiltonian takes on the correct form. So we need to have the general theory of what kinds of Hamiltonians give you Lorentz invariance, and we don't have that yet. So all we do is pick a reference frame and go forward with that. The interesting thing is that if you really believe that our observable universe has a finite dimensional Hilbert space, you cannot represent Lorentz invariance exactly on a finite dimensional Hilbert space. There's a theorem in math, you cannot represent uh, non-compact groups on finite dimensional vector spaces. So it's very possible that in this approach, Lorentz invariance is only going to be approximate and there will be violations of Lorentz invariance experimentally. Uh, I can't tell you what the prediction is for those yet, but I would love to know. Okay, so uh, you're saying the, in the moment you choose how you write down your Hamiltonian, you chose uh, from the program. That's right, yes. Okay, and uh, a second question would be, um, so you mentioned before that you can have the possibilities of emergent time and our time being fundamental. And uh, in the situations when time is emergent, does that happen in a similar way in the way you found emergent space? You know, it, it's, a, it's a good question and I, I think that the best answer is no. It's not a very similar way. You know, entanglement is still involved, but it's not entanglement between different moments of time. It's, it's, it's entanglement between different readings of a clock and the rest of the physical system. So uh, Ashmeet, my collaborator, uh, has been thinking about this and he wrote a paper that's on the archive, you know, about trying to make emergent time look like emergent space. But it's only kind of half-baked right now. You know, it, 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 time and space are just different in quantum mechanics. And uh, 
We know that because position is an observable and time is not. So it's not clear whether that difference is apparent or fundamental. So I think this is still an interesting set of questions to think about. Okay, thank you very much. Next, Nehal, please ask. Uh, hi, Sean. Uh, my question is related to the many world interpretation. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, I don't understand what is the role that your apparatus is playing here. So if you think about from uh, the Schrodinger's cat perspective, uh, you have a cat and uh, you, uh, you have this sleeping gas, right? Now, uh, what exactly does the measurement do uh, or what, uh, what, what exactly does looking at the cat do? Because uh, your cat was already in the superposition, right? That's right. So in, what is the role of, of the apparatus here? None at all in that particular case. The cat itself is a macroscopic object. It becomes entangled with the environment and decoherence happens. So the apparatus is, all the apparatus is in Everettian quantum mechanics is a macroscopic system that becomes entangled with the environment. Any such system counts because what you care about is decoherence. You don't have words like measurement and apparatus. Those are key human constructions, but decoherence is what really matters. I see. Shona, please ask the question. Yeah, I had a question with the interpretation of uh, the Everton uh, interpretation only. So there was a slide which mentioned that uh, when there is a uh, entangle bit, entanglement between the uh, apparatus and the system itself, so it prohibits the interference between two states. So can it also uh, explain the delayed choice quantum uh, eraser experiments, like when there is a detector, we can't see an interference of photons in two states or when we actually remove the, erase the part of knowing about the path it takes, we actually see the interference. Yeah, 100%. I mean, there's no problem whatsoever with the delayed choice quantum eraser in Everettian quantum mechanics. It all comes down to the fact that the delayed choice quantum eraser basically uses a trick, namely of quasi decoherence, right? Like decoherence, as mm -hmm. I talked about it, was when a macroscopic apparatus becomes entangled with the environment. And the environment is billions and billions of particles. And once that entanglement happens, it, there's no going back. But in the delayed choice quantum eraser, you can entangle a photon or a particle with just one other particle, not a billion different particles. So if you entangle with just one other particle, that counts as being entangled and the interference goes away. But also you can undo that, right? You can keep your knowledge of the state of that quantum particle to undo it. And so all of that is just the Schrodinger equation. There's really zero mystery for any of that if you're a, an Everettian. Thank you. Any other questions? Please ask. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, the lecture was very enlightening and uh, I'm a huge admirer of yours. Thank uh, you. Sir, I had this, uh, I had this, I had this, yeah, sir, I have this one question regarding Bell's theorem that you said uh, that uh, uh, hidden variables cannot be local. So, so, sir, what's local and how do you define it? Well, in this case, local means that influences um, cannot spread faster than the speed of light. So the, you can invent a theory uh, like Bohm did where particles have locations in space but they influence each other through the wave function non-locally, okay? The wave function is pushing these particles around. There's something called the guidance equation. The wave function, the, the particle is being affected by parts of the wave function all over. So you can't ask what's gonna, what the particle's gonna do just based on what's happening in one region of space. That's the absence of locality. And you know you need that because of the EPR experiment. You know, some version of non-locality is needed. Yeah, yes, yeah, right, right. Sir, also, I have got just this one more question. I, I was pretty nervous to ask it back then. Uh, sir, uh, if, antid if uh, antidecitive space is not real and uh, we don't live in that space, then why study it? I mean, what's the significance of studying the ADS space? 
Well, you know, simple harmonic oscillators are not real either. <laughs> real oscillators have friction and, and harmonic terms and things like that. It's an idealization. It's a thought experiment, okay? So the hope of people who work on ADS-CFT is that we will learn general features of entanglement and quantum gravity. And it, the hope is very plausibly true. I mean, people are learning a lot about how information escapes from evaporating black holes in the context of ADS-CFT. So ADS-CFT gives us an example of a perfectly well-defined theory of quantum gravity. It's not the example that we live in, but if you have any example of a perfectly well-defined theory of quantum gravity, that's something you can take advantage of. All right, all right. Th thanks a lot, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, any other questions? Yes. yes. I have a question. Uh, okay. Please raise your hand. Otherwise, I can't allow you. Okay, because there are lots of people are asking questions and it is already, I can see it is already two hours. <laughs> it is. So I have to stop right now because then it otherwise it will continue. Um, yeah, uh, I will not allow any of that question because it is already two hours. And uh, yeah, uh, maybe last one last question because Arya haven't asked any questions. So one last question. Arya, please you ask. Aria, you can. Uh, hello, sir. Yes. Uh, I want to ask that how does the event horizon merge during the black hole collision? Okay, I mean, it's a, that's a complicated question. Yeah, well, there's a simple answer. You know, they, they merge just like this. It just becomes one big black hole. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's a much more complicated question uh, that you can only solve numerically. Like once you have two black holes approaching each other, um, it's impossible to get an analytic solution to Einstein's equations. They're too complicated. Uh, but you can go online, you can find numerical simulations and you see the you know, two black holes, their event horizons looking like this and they come together and they just, they just merge. It's exactly like two drops of water coming together to form one drop of water. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, and I have an, another question. Uh, can a black hole pass through a wormhole? Oh, uh, can a black hole pass through a wormhole? I actually don't know the answer to that one. I think the answer is yes, if the wormhole is bigger than the event horizon of the black hole. I suspect that wormholes don't exist in the real world, so I think this is not a high priority question, but um, uh, you would... It's an interesting question, and I have to think about it more. So you, you got me on that one. Sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, yeah, you guys are raising hand at the end. How I, I can go? Allow. Yeah. So I do have oh, to go. Sorry. This this process will continue. I can't allow this thing. Just I want to say one uh, thing last that uh, uh, like. Somebody have pointed some uh, Ryu Takayanagi formula in the ADS or something like that. So I just want to ask that some people uh, calculate the scattering amplitudes in uh, ADS and then uh, analytically continue to the DS. You know that, and you get the similar and same same answer in the DS if you calculate from the quantum field theory side. So uh, like. Uh, why people do that? Like, uh, what is the <laughs> uh, Yeah, I'm not the one to ask. I, I believe that it's very possible, but this is an example of, of a more general idea, namely that ADS CFT is a tool that can be used, right? I mean, yeah. people use it in condensed matter physics and nuclear physics. There's yeah. sort of ADS uh, calculations of the quark gluon plasma and things like that. So, you know, it is a useful tool even if ADS is not where we live. No, I, I just want to uh, say this because like uh, that guy pointed that there might be a connection with the, the ADS part with your DS calculation. Yeah, maybe. Might, yeah. Be, might be. So th in that way, I am saying that, yeah, maybe you can do some kind of. So like, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you and it's a really nice uh, 
uh, overview that you have given and so that today probably i have uh, seen it is exceeded 100 people wonderful oh, yeah and it's around 110 or something and a lot of people are asking questions so i uh, guys i i would suggest to you please uh, directly email him because then you can uh, get some answer okay okay yes thank you very much thanks yeah. for inviting me and uh, uh, like the last thing is the it, it it for all it is right now the preference is has to be safe so stay safe and be healthy and uh, Hopefully we can meet uh, some other time like Paris last time in 2018. So in some other meeting we will meet. That sounds very good. Thanks for having me. You all stay safe too. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.